Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Russ Congleton, uh, professor of remote sensing and geographic information systems uh, at the university. And so I get to do all kinds of fun things. I get to use those tools to solve problems all the time, and I get to work with all kinds of new things and get to figure out all kinds of things. And I got to buy some new toys in the last couple of years. And the, Anita keeps calling them my toys, and so they really are. And so what I want to talk to you a little bit about this afternoon is using these toys or unmanned aerial systems to map forests and uh, just talk about some of the lessons that we've learned. So let's see. Yes, good. So what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is learning something about an object without coming in contact with it. So trying to learn uh, from a distance. And um, there's lots and lots of benefits of that because we can do things at different levels of detail related to spatial scales. We can use different um, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum and we can do it over whatever time frames we want to. So some projects require knowing something every hour, some things we could care uh, you know, once a year or something. And so here are some images um, and they don't show up half as good on the uh, projector screen as they do if you looked at them on your computer. But there's uh, an image that we generated that's probably about 4,000 um, images that we flew with our one UAS system of uh, College Woods on campus and then there's a, a zoom in on just one of them uh, right there. And so what do we do with remote sensing? We tend to make thematic maps or land cover maps, vegetation maps, um, and there's historically been two different ways that that gets done. One is the traditional way which was based on a pixel based classification. So you can see here that we've got these little cookie cutters that come down and image the ground and whatever's inside of that cookie cutter um, gets sensed by the sensor and records that information in the different wavelengths. And we can have fairly poor resolution or very big pixels or we can have higher resolution data and get smaller and smaller and smaller pixels. But the way that's classified, the way we label that is by pixel. And then more recently we've gotten into what's called object-based classification which is much more mimics what the human being sees when they um, look at things, okay? And so when we look at something, we immediately group things together. We say this is similar and there's a line here and I, I know that's different over here and so it makes a lot more sense than having these arbitrary squares. And so this is a new technique called object-based classification. Um, and you can see here the process where those pixels are grouped into what we call segments or objects or if you like, um, polygons um, to be able to do it. Okay, and so especially with this high resolution remotely sensed data, when we're getting data that's uh, one meter, four meters, even now we're getting um, satellite imagery that's about 35 centimeters in size, you want to be able to get details about that. You want to group things together um, so that you don't have just a pixel of the sunlit part of the tree and a pixel of the shadow part of the tree and a pixel of the stem of the tree. You want the tree, so you want to be able to group it together. And so you can see this is the actual imagery and here are these polygons or these objects that are being generated that represent more what's going on. With the UAS imagery, we're now getting three centimeter um, pixels and so it becomes even more of a big deal uh, to be able to do that. Okay. Some of the powerful things that we can generate, not only do we take the imagery itself, but because of the, um, a lot of the mathematics that we can use, in fact a new computer modeling technique called structure for motion, we can take that imagery and remove um, the topography from it. So an object um, that has change in elevation, when you take a picture of it from above, it looks like it's laying down on its side. You've all uh, probably seen that before. And so we can create what we call planimetric imagery or orthomosaics. And again, that's an orthomosaic there of, of Kingman Farm that we took with one of our um, UAS systems. And so that's a really, really powerful thing um, to be able to do with these new UAS systems and this software, this Structure for Motion software. As far as UAS goes, there's lots and lots of abbreviations for them. It doesn't really matter what you call it, except you don't want to call it a drone. So drone seems to be a derogatory term. You know, it kind of has those military applications. It's, it kind of sounds like there's no intelligence behind it. 
much preferred term is um, UAS, unmanned aerial system. Some people say UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle. Um, but really as a system, there's lots and lots of components to the system, okay? You can see there's the, the payload itself, there's the um, aircraft, there's the control and command center, there's the communications link, there's how you're gonna fly, and then of course there's the human being. So it becomes you know, a very nice system. So we've been trying to use um, the term UAS, um, and that seems to be, have been the one that's kind of taken over uh, the most. But if you can avoid drone, that's probably a good thing, but when everybody looks at you and you say UAS, you go drone, and then they know what you're talking about, so it's a little bit of a problem. So we have a bunch of different kinds of systems. There are rotary wing systems, more helicopter type things, and then there are fixed wing systems, and I'll show you more about the toys that we have in a minute. So, one of the first things that you have to battle through if you want to do anything in the United States related to this is deal with uh, uh, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration regulations. And until uh, September of 2016, those were a big deal. It took about six months and a lawyer uh, to get permission from the FAA to fly if you were going to collect any kind of information at all. Okay, if you're a hobbyist, you could do whatever you wanted to do. And we have some issues on campus with hobbyists who are you know, probably not having the best hobbies in the world and peeking in the windows of people and things like that. And then there was the government, what they were doing, and so then there was this other group and they didn't quite know what to do with it. But uh, in uh, September of 2016, the FAA passed this Part 107, which is a remote pilot in charge, or remote pilot in command uh, certification, which requires just taking an exam. It's an exam about nautical charts and all the regulations related to flying. It's reasonable to do uh, as a small fee associated with it. And then um, you can fly as long as you fly within the constraints of that certification. And so right now I have three graduate students um, who are uh, remote pilots in charge and they've been flying all the time. There's Ben who is part of the research I'm explaining today is his, and I've got another student named Tether, and she's doing some stuff, and then we have a third student who's starting to look at, um, brand new master's student who's gonna fly some stuff for uh, invasive species. So, gotta know about that. If you wanna know anything about that, the best place to go is the knowbeforeyoufly.org um, uh, thing on uh, federal government sites. So. So here's one of the um, systems that we have. This is a SenseFly EB+. So it's a big piece of styrofoam. If you bu just buy the styrofoam with no sensors involved at all, it costs $19,000 for a piece of styrofoam. You go, why the heck did I have to pay that much money for that? But that's what it costs. It's really, really cool. You kind of hold it like this. There's a propeller in the back and you throw it into the air and it launches itself and, and does a really nice job. There are a bunch of different sensors that you can put on that standard camera systems, as well as multi-spectral um, scanners. We've got both what's called the SOTA, the sensor optimized for drone applications, and the Sequoia sensor um, that allows us to get lots and lots of good imagery. This is what we're gonna use more for um, looking at invasive species. Uh, it, it says it'll fly for 59 minutes. Apparently it'll fly a little longer than that, but regulations in Europe say they, they can't fly longer than 59 minutes. They can't fly for an hour. So I think that's why this one's set up for that way. It has a own software for autonomous flying. In other words, you program it into the computer and then it flies itself. You really wouldn't want to try to fly it even if you could. There is an emergency situation where you can take control of the, of the bird if you have to. Um, and you can get a uh, distance of about two kilometers away and still um, control the system. This is our, our number one system at this point that we're using. This was our first system that we got and I um, actually thank the Ag Experiment Station for their support in uh, purchasing this for us. We, we called this um, our bleeding edge technology. We, we bought this before we were even allowed to fly and so you could do a little testing with it, but we couldn't do very much. It weighs about 45 pounds, so if it falls on you, we're gonna be in big trouble. Um, it has a very nice digital camera with it. The big problem is that it only can fly for about 11 minutes. 
using these big honking batteries um, that sit up there uh, on top of it. It's very nice if you want to go up, do something in the canopy, and come back down. And that's what the copter-based systems are really designed for. Okay. Um, so you can see pretty heavy uh, takeoff. We're, we're replacing that right now um, with a Skyhawk system that we're expecting delivery of in the next two to three weeks, which will be lighter, flies much longer, um, isn't an optocopter, doesn't have the eight blades on it, just the four, but it still works um, a lot better. So this technology is changing at about every three weeks. Um, there's something new coming out, and so um, it, it gets a little crazy. Also know that you can do lots of things with a fairly inexpensive system. This is a thousand dollar Phantom 2. It's actually completely obsolete at this point, but we just bought a Phantom 4, um, which is basically identically the same system. They're, these are really cool. You can fly it inside. If I brought it with me, I could have flown it, and if I take it and I throw it towards the wall, it even knows the wall's there and it'll stop itself. Okay, so these are pretty neat. They have decent cameras on them, um, and you know, a, a really excited hobbyist would buy one of these. Uh, so we want to make sure we see what's going on with that versus the very expensive systems, okay? These are manually controlled and very easy to control. If you buy one of those little toy ones that you can buy for $100 and you try to manually control it either with your phone or with the little system that comes with it, you'll find that you bounce it off the ground all the time. Um, it's very difficult to fly unless you're 14 years old, then they have no problems flying them. But I have great trouble flying them. But when I flew this, I was like, I can do this. This is <laughs> awesome. And if you let go of it, if you, if you have to let go of the controls, it just hovers and waits for you to tell it to do something. Whereas if I let go of the little toy ones that I play with, that's where I bounce it off the ground for sure. So um, really, really neat stuff to do. So there's mission planning uh, software associated with this so that you can figure out exactly what area you want to cover and how much overlap. This whole technology depends on many, many, many photos of taken of the same area from different angles and then lots and lots of computer processing to put all that um, together. So there's all kinds of mission planning software and where you want to fly and how high you want to fly and you know, all that kind of information that's available. And then uh, always want to do some calibration. So there was lots and lots of trial and error. So we were very grateful to have a system that we could kind of play with um, early on. And so here you can see we've got uh, an area from 125 meters above the canopy, and then 100 meters above the canopy, and then 50 meters above the canopy, and then 25 meters above the canopy. And so you, we did a lot of analysis to try to figure out you know, how could we get all this what, what uh, is the optimal height to fly for our particular objectives? We also flew, uh, with the pr pr permission of the UNH uh, Athletic Department, we flew over um, the field all the time, the football field, because it, we know the distances on there, right? Every, the yard markers are there. So we were able to do lots of calibration uh, related to Wildcat Stadium. So that was very nice to be able to do. As far as the processing goes, there are two major software packages that are being used right now for doing this. One is called uh, PIX4D and the other one is called uh, Photoscan. Two different companies. We have three copies of one and two copies of the other piece of software. They both do this structure for motion algorithm. Okay, and so here you can see this is the result of a flight plan with the EB, uh, one of the UNH um, properties. And so it takes off and it kind of circles around and it gets ready to go. And then it goes back and forth and back and forth. And you'd, you'd think those would be nice straight lines, but the wind, if there's any wind at all, with that little styrofoam thing, it's blowing it all over the place. And so it's taking pictures from all kinds of angles. And then what it does is it takes hours and hours and hours of computer processing on a very, very um, big computer. We just bought a computer with 256 gigs of RAM in it um, so we could um, do processing of this imagery. And then it works out really, really nice, and it tells you where it works, and it tells you where it doesn't work, and that's really good. Okay. So there's lots and lots of applications of what we could do with UAS, and it's, there's more being done every day. Certainly lots and lots of things being done with precision agriculture, but you know, wildlife monitoring, fire, any kind of emergency response kinds of things. 
We're doing a lot of work with uh, inventory kinds of stuff, uh, coastal mapping. The big deal here is this bottom line. The fact is it gives us this great flexibility. It's easily modified. We can put whatever sensors we want on it. It gives us on demand. We want to go out today. The weather cooperates. We're out there. We're flying. We get really, really, really great high resolution, better than anything we've ever gotten before. And uh, for a fairly low cost relative to everything else we've ever paid for, for remotely sensed data. So there are three projects that my lab, my lab is called the Basic and Applied Spatial Analysis Lab that we're doing uh, right now. We had a big pilot study that went on with Ben's master's thesis where we were looking at one of my big things, my research over the last uh, 40 years has been on looking at the accuracy of how good we can map using satellite imagery. And in order to evaluate that, you have to go to the ground and get some samples on the ground so you can compare what's on the ground to what's on the map, okay? And so you do that through what's called an error matrix where one side of the matrix, it's just a contingency table, one side of the matrix says, you know, what the map says and the other one is the samples that you've taken on the ground and wherever they agree, if you sum that major diagonal, that's the uh, overall accuracy and you can calculate other things related to that. But the big expense is getting that ground reference data. So we've been, we did a pilot study for his thesis on uh, UNH properties, on some of the woodland properties, six different areas, looking at um, if we could use the UAS to collect that reference data more effectively and more efficiently than we would if we went to the ground. So can we fly and then can we do some uh, evaluation of that imagery to get those same kinds of things. And we were able to compare that to the continuous forest inventory data sets that other people in the department and Steve Eisenhower as the um, UNH land manager have been collecting over time. So that's a big thing that we've been working on. Another thing that I've got a PhD student just starting to look at this year is about the impact of fragmentation in the forest on edges and the, the fact that the more and more fragmentation occurs, it changes those, uh, we increase the number of edges in a forest and those edges are very, very important for invasive plant coming in, it changes how wildlife looks at things, all kinds of uh, important ecosystem effects due to edge. Can we measure the edge from above from the UAS imagery instead of having to go to the ground to do that? And I mentioned I have a new student who's um, joined with another professor with Jenica Allen looking at uh, invasive plants. So. so what have we learned so far? Well, luckily, things keep getting easier and easier and easier. We had lots of trial and error. I think we've gone through the, you know, the tough part of things, and so we feel like we know what we're doing at this point. That flying height above the forest is definitely a key issue for us at this point, and we're still working towards that. The processing, as I said, you can collect the imagery pretty quickly, but processing, it takes more and more time. Uh, uh, like in the old days, when I first was in grad school, it used to take forever to process even this really poor resolution imagery. Now we're in the same situation with this very high resolution imagery, but that software is improving all the time. And so we're pretty happy with what we've been able to do and definitely appreciate the uh, support of the uh, Ag Experiment Station in doing that. So, any questions? Does your uh, image processing software, did, can that take images and make objects out of it, or is that still like... There's another piece of software that does that. Yeah, there's something called eCognition that actually takes the pixelated data and, and makes objects out of it. But you, mean you can like tell it how to do that, basically? Or? Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of parameters that you set to do that. Yeah, there's a scale parameter, there's a, a color parameter, there's different things that you can do. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, so, so we try to fly when there's as little wind as possible, um, but, but we can fly up to about, if the wind's even blowing at about 15 miles per hour. Um, the issue is that you have to fly slower. It, 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 what it does is you, you try to fly into the wind and, and out of the wind, 
But the problem is when you're flying into the wind, you're flying a lot slower, and then you're flying the other way, and you're flying a lot faster than you want to, and so it kind of messes things up um, to some extent. Now with the copter-based systems that are heavier, that, that's really not an issue. The issue is how long can you be in the air? But these nice styrofoam things, you know, it wants to just kind of float along there. It just has this little propeller on the back. Um, so we try to fly when there's almost no wind. So, but doesn't always work. You think there's going to be no wind, and then there's gusts here and whatever there. So, yeah, Yago. Thank you. What, what's, what invasive species are you looking at first? Yeah. So actually, what uh, Dr. Lee is going to talk about, we're looking, going to be looking at the glossy buckthorn. Yeah, that's one of the first things. And so I'm not the invasive species guy. I'm the fly this technology guy, and Jenica Allen and Dr. Lee and others are, are the experts on that. So, uh, but I know that well. Dr. Lee has a uh, McIntyre Stennis proposal in that, and so does Jenica Allen. So, yep. Okay, I think we better move on. Yep. Good. Thanks.